Heritage. My name's Josh, and one of the ministry areas that I'm involved with here at Heritage is uh, the Care and Connection team. We have a variety of teams operating that, that kind of just start from a place of compassion and, and a desire to see people plug in relationally. You can make a dessert, you can write a card, you can make a phone call. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can express compassion to another person that attends Heritage. So if you're interested in getting involved in one of our Care and Connection teams, I would love to see you get plugged in. Just go to our website, fill out a digital connection card, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Hi, I'm Carolyn, and I have the privilege of serving as the Missional Engagement Pastor here at Heritage Church. Now, that's a really fancy way of saying I get the opportunity to work with our local outreach projects and initiatives, our ministry partners in the community and throughout the world, our missionaries, missions agencies, and pretty much anything that happens outside the walls of the church. There are so many ways that you can be involved of demonstrating the love of Christ to our community, our nation, and even the world. So if you're interested in more details or how to sign up or to volunteer with even one of our ministry partners, please feel free to reach out to me at 309-732-0044. I look forward to connecting with you. Hey, I'm Bryce. I work with the kids here at Heritage Church. That's age zero through fifth grade. If you'd like any information or how to get your kid connected to some of our programming here at Heritage Church, come on to our Kids Hub. That's upstairs in Rock Island and downstairs at Bettendorf. We have some more information for you, or you can sign up for next week. Hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Paul Anderson, your operations pastor. The operations team at Heritage exists to serve our church family in the areas of IT and general technology, uh, facilities, buildings and grounds, maintenance and repair, and special projects. Our hope and prayer is that through our service, we can help free up our ministry teams to have more time to minister to people. Hey Heritage family, I'm Pastor Michaela. One of the things that I do here at Heritage is I head up some of the spiritual formation ministries. One of those, which is our small groups. If you are not connected in a small group, I wanna encourage you to do so because God created us to do life together, not in isolation. If you would like to get connected to a group, there are a couple of ways that you can do this. You can go online to heritageqc.com and you can fill out our digital connection card. Or you can go to the Church Center app and you can connect on the groups, kind of take a look through and browse through which ones you like, and you can connect that way as well. We have so many opportunities in small groups. We have women's groups, men's groups, adult co-ed groups, singles groups, even young adult groups. Truly, this is a wonderful way for you to be plugged in and for your spiritual formation to be cultivated by others. Hi, I'm Pastor Zach Sandry, and I'm our next-gen pastor in charge of Heritage Student Ministry. We meet Sunday nights from 6 to 8 p.m., rotating between our Bettendorf and Rock Island campuses. I really love to provide space for students to encounter the risen Jesus and to pursue a personal relationship with Him. We hope to see you or your students there. Here it is, church. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing pretty good. Would you stand with me? Come on, let's sing this together. You came from glory, took on flesh to save the lost, grace and mercy displayed upon the cross, our redemption. He's the hope for all mankind, one name over everything, one name over everything. Come on, sing this with us. Jesus over everything. Jesus over King in one moment, he brought. 
brought death to his knees all the power oh and all authority one name over everything come on sing it one name over everything jesus Found a place to land 
On Christ the perfect Son Who would redeem it all again Looking for the branches And landed on the vine The one for our redemption Who would bridge eternal life Holy Spirit The truth
for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris, and uh, I had the privilege of being the interim pastor here for about 16 months during a time of transition, and uh, I'm just so happy to be able to be here with you this morning. Uh, it was two years ago, um, two years ago, and two years and almost two months ago that I first called Pastor Brian, and I said, um, Pastor Brian, there's a church in the Quad Cities, and I would love for you to consider coming being the senior pastor of this church. And, uh, and we had a great conversation about that. And uh, he was the first phone call I made. When I knew Heritage was going to be open, I knew we were going to be in this transition, the first call I made was to Pastor Brian Savage. Because I really sensed in my spirit that he was the person that God had for this place. And, um, and here's the deal. He, we had a great conversation. And uh, he showed some initial interest, and we just prayed about it. And then I remember the fateful day when he called me and said, I can't do it right now. And I said, okay, God, I trust you. If you want second best for Heritage, okay, I mean, you know, whatever. And, um, and, and then God worked out the timing and did amazing things in Pastor Brian and Kara's life and in Heritage's life. Here's why I tell you that. There's something going on in your life right now that doesn't make sense time-wise. And you don't get it. Job hasn't come open yet. Infertility. Finances aren't coming through yet. Relationship isn't healed yet. Something doesn't make sense. Can I tell you? God is working out his perfect timing in your life. Because God wildly loves you. And he hasn't given up on you. He hasn't left you. Let this story about Pastor Brian and Kara and the timing of heritage, let that story be an encouragement to your own soul and spirit and heart that his timing is working all things out in your life as well. Now, uh, you're going to see a different side of Chris Conner this morning. I'm actually going to be a bit formal. Uh, some of you had no idea that I had that side. Um, it's rare, but it comes out every once in a while. Um, and uh, there's, uh, so Brian, why don't you come up if you would? Uh, this other gentleman has no idea I'm going to do this, but we have the privilege of having a guy by the name of uh, Dennis Jackson in the house. Dennis, would you come up? Um, Dennis is in charge of the whole missions organization side of this thing called the Wesleyan Church. Uh, he's in charge of global partners, which means that he travels all over and um, is involved with missionaries all over the world. He's a dear friend of mine and a dear friend of Brian's. And uh, it's great to have Dennis here who drove five hours one way from Indianapolis to be here uh, for this weekend. And uh, it was funny. We all went to a Mexican restaurant last night, and Dennis and I were sitting next to each other. We were engaged in this conversation. And what do they give you at Mexican restaurants you, when you first sit down? What do they give you? Exactly. So Dennis and I are sitting there talking. Brian and Josh and Melissa Howard are across on there, and they're eating all the chips. So Dennis turns to get a chip, and they're all gone. Like this one little tiny chip. And uh, my wife took a picture of that, and uh, we gave Dennis all manner of Grief over the fact that that was all he was going to be able to eat. So, here we go. Um, Dennis, I'm going to have you just lay your hands on Brian here in a few minutes. You don't have to do it quite yet because it might feel awkward if you do it already. But that's okay. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Have fun. Dear Heritage Congregation, you've invited an overwhelmingly voted Pastor Brian Savage to serve as your pastor. Well, I couldn't be any more excited about that. We're excited the Holy Spirit has called Brian, Kara, and their family to provide leadership for heritage into the future that we believe God has for you and to help you to continue to realize your full redemptive potential as a church. We believe great kingdom advancing days are ahead for heritage and that God wants to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask, dream of, or imagine. I'm going to ask Pastor Brian 15, actually not that many questions, and then turn to you as a congregation and ask you a few questions as well. Pastor Brian, what is the square root? Oh, I'm kidding. I have no idea. Well, you can. <laughs> we have all, all of the above. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have no secret idea. All of the above. We've taken so many trips together. Brian and I have taken so many trips. We just love each other. Okay. Will you commit yourself to maintaining a relationship with Jesus Christ that is actively growing and close? Do you commit to pursue Jesus in a winsome manner? so that others will want to follow you as you follow Christ? The answer is yes, I will pursue him continually. Yes, I will pursue him continually. Praise be to God. Pastor Brian, do you commit yourself to preach the word of God in all its fullness, to treat it 
respect it as the inspired word of God, the answer is, I will indeed. I will indeed. Do you commit yourself to courageously lead this congregation into the future that God has for you both? Do you commit to continually help them keep an outward focus so that as a body you will follow the words of Jesus who said the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost? In other words, will you commit yourself to lead heritage, to continue to love their neighbors, to love those who are far from God, to reach out to the brokenhearted, to exemplify the story Jesus told in Luke 15 about a shepherd who would leave the 99 and go after the one? The answer is absolutely. Absolutely. Pastor Brian, do you commit yourself to fulfill the Apostle Paul's calling on pastors outlined in Ephesians 4, where he encouraged pastors to equip the individuals within the church to do the work of the ministry? Do you commit to remind your brothers and sisters in Christ of the gifts and the abilities that God has placed inside of them? Do you commit to encouraging them to combine those gifts and abilities with their God-given purpose so that they can live into and fulfill the destiny that God has for them individually? Do you commit to give ministry away to them so that they are the ministers and you are the equipper? The answer is I commit to equipping them and putting them to work. I commit to equipping them and putting them to work. Yeah. See, we got a sweet job. <laughs> we get to equip you and put you to work. Yeah. <laughs> we like that. Pastor Brian, do you commit to raising up leaders at Heritage who can join you in, this le in leading this congregation? Do you commit to growing in leadership yourself and then turning around and training those at Heritage who are asked to serve in leadership positions, to grow as leaders in those positions? The answer is, I will raise up leaders, God being my helper. I will raise up leaders, God being my helper. And finally, Pastor Brian, do you commit to continue to love your beautiful wife, Kara, in such a way that you will not sacrifice your relationship with her or your relationship with your two awesome kids on the altar of your job? Brian and Kara and Mary and I are good friends. Spend some good time together. Will you continue to keep the vows that you both made to each other and love Kara as Christ loves the church? The answer is you bet. You bet. Good for you. You bet. Regular attenders of Heritage, will you commit to support Pastor Brian in his leadership of the church? Will you commit to pray for him on a regular basis? Will you commit to love him, believe in him, encourage him, and give him the benefit of the doubt? In another seven years, when Brian makes his first mistake, <laughs> will you commit yeah. to offer him grace and support? Will you commit to never gossip about Pastor Brian, but instead to come to him directly if you have any concerns about his leadership of heritage? Will you commit to talk to God and then talk to him before you talk to anybody else? Will you commit to discovering and deploying your God-given spiritual gifts and abilities to help reach the greater Quad Cities area and the region? Will you commit to embracing the fact that Pastor Brian is the equipper and actually you are the minister? Will you commit to allowing Kara and the Savage family to be who they are and not put them on some ridiculously high pedestal that causes them to fear that they can never be human and make a mistake? And finally, will you lock arms with them and work together to accomplish the goal of seeing people drawn into a relationship with Jesus Christ through the ministry of this church? The answer is yes, we make this commitment. Amen. Two things. Um, can we just thank God for, because maybe you've already done this. You probably did this on the day that you voted for Pastor Brian, and what an overwhelmingly incredible vote that he got. But can we just say again thank you to our great God who knew what he was doing from the very beginning and knew who he had raised up. Can we just say thank you to God who's just done a marvelous job. Marvel. And now, would you mind standing? And we do this every once in a while in the church. We kind of raise, we kind of lift our hands out. And I'm asked, Pastor Dennis, if he would just put his hands on Brian as a substitute for all your hands, because that would be a little awkward to have hundreds and hundreds of hands on Brian. So, um, yeah. So, Lord Jesus, in this moment right now, we're so thankful for your servant, Brian, for his awesome wife, Kara, for their two kids. And we pray, God, for a fresh outpouring of your spirit and your anointing to be on him. We pray, God, that you would use him in a powerful way. God, we pray for this congregation that you would allow them to see an incredible outpouring together of your spirit. I even sense it this morning during the worship time, God. You're already beginning to pour out your spirit in a fresh way, in a new way, and we're thankful for that. But God, we sense you're just getting started. We pray, God, that there would come 
to heritage a revival, an absolute revival of your spirit that would result in literally hundreds and then thousands of people coming to know you as their Lord and Savior, that lives would be transformed, that, that relationships would be healed, that addictions would be broken, that people would experience hope and life in your name, Jesus, and healing in your name. God, we just pray that you would pour out wisdom and discernment to your son, Brian, God. Help him to know if he should go to the right or to the left. Help him never to feel like he has to decide. Help him always to feel like he's discerning your good, perfect, and pleasing will, God. That he hears from you and that he's guided by you. And would you help us as a congregation to pray for him, to surround him, to lift him up, to encourage him, to give him high fives and fist bumps and to look him in the eye and to say, I'm so proud of you, Brian. I'm so blessed. And God, would you please do what only you can do in this city, God? Break out in revival in this city, God, and in this region, we pray. God, we're thankful for the other churches in this area that know you and love you and that proclaim your name. We're thankful for them, God. We're not the only church in town. We don't need to be, but we pray in Jesus' name that you would use this church to do all that you want to do in and through this place, we pray, God. And very few people in this room know Dennis, but I pray that you continue to anoint him for the work that you've called him to do all over this globe. I pray that he would feel your indwelling presence in a fresh way. Thank you, God, for this day. Now speak to us through the words that you've given Brian to say to us this morning. In Christ's name, and everybody said, Now, turn to your neighbor and say, we've got awesome days ahead of us. Go ahead. Turn to your neighbor and say, we've got awesome days ahead of us. All right, dear friends, you can take a seat. Oh, it's so good to see you. So good to see you. Amen. Father, I pray that uh, my words would not be my own. I pray that you would speak through me now. Give us ears to hear, Lord. Let us be ready for your word, and we pray that your word would be life-changing today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On a cold November evening in 2004, Victoria Ruvalo was driving to her home on Long Island. She had just uh, attended her niece's dance recital, and she was now ready for the couch, a warm fire, and some relaxation. Victoria doesn't remember seeing the silver Nissan approach from the east. She remembers nothing of the 18-year-old Ryan Cushing leaning out of his car window as their cars passed, and he was holding, of all things, a frozen turkey. As Victoria's car passed by, Ryan Cushing threw the frozen turkey at her windshield. The 20-pound bird crashed through the windshield, bent her steering wheel inward, and shattered her face like a dinner plate on concrete. The violent prank left Victoria grappling for her life in the ICU. Now, Victoria survived, but only after doctors had wired her jaw, affixed one eye with synthetic film, and bolted titanium plates to her cranium. Victoria couldn't even look in the mirror without the reminder of the hurt and pain that she had been through. Fast forward nine months after this disastrous November night, and now Victoria stood face to face with her offender, Ryan Cushing, in court. Ryan was no longer this this cocky, arrogant young man. In fact, here in court, he found himself trembling. He was tearful, and he was very apologetic. You see, for New York City, Ryan Cushing had come to symbolize a generation of kids who were just completely out of control. And so people packed the courtroom on the day of his sentencing. He was actually going to be tried as an adult, and the reports suggested he was going to have at least a 25-year sentence for his crime. The courtroom judge glared at Ryan as he handed down the sentence. Only six months behind bars, only five years of probation, some counseling, and a few hours of public service. The judge's gavel suddenly underscored the chaos that erupted in the courtroom as the people who were there began to yell their objections at such a light sentence. But then the chaos quickly turned to calm when the courtroom learned that the reduced sentence 
was actually Victoria's idea. The crowded courtroom let out an audible gasp when suddenly Victoria, in the courtroom, she walked over to her offender, Ryan Cushing. She wrapped her arms around him, held him tight, began to even stroke the back of his hair. And as this young man began uncontrollably sobbing in the, in the arms of the woman he almost killed, Victoria whispered into his ear, I forgive you. And I want your life to be the best it can be. That is nothing short of a miracle. How could a woman look at the man who almost killed her, a man who put her in the hospital fighting for her life, a man who would physically cause her pain every morning that she would wake up for the rest of her life? How could a woman look at that type of a man and say to him, I forgive you? Dear friends, I believe the only way that can happen is through the very power of Jesus Christ. Victoria understood that she herself had received the miracle of Christ's forgiveness in her own life, and so it was only right to extend that same miracle of forgiveness to her offender. You see, much like Ryan Cushing, I believe every single one of us in this room this morning, we need to experience the forgiveness of our sins. We too, we need to be set free from bitterness and hate and pride or arrogance or lust or stubbornness, whatever it is, you name it. If we we truly need to be set free this morning, and I believe it begins with the miracle of forgiveness that Jesus wants to offer to every man, woman, and child. As we begin the second week, of our series, God of Miracles. This morning, I want to help you discover the very forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And we're going to do it through an unusual story. If you have your Bible, I hope that you will open it up to the very Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 17. I want to read this story together, and it's going to be somewhat of a surprising story, and then we're going to dissect everything that the Lord wants us to learn. Here's the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law, well, they were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up in every village in all of Galilee and Judea, as well as Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, and this is surprising, young man, Your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law, they said to themselves, who does he think he is? Well, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, he said, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or to say, stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus, he turned to the paralyzed man. He said, stand up, pick up your mats, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, he picked up his mat, and he went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. The word of the Lord. Here we have a man that couldn't walk. Here's a man who who couldn't even stand on his own. His, His limbs were bent. His body was twisted. A busy world walked by as this man just sat and stared. Perhaps, we don't know the backstory, but perhaps this man, his body was was ridden with disease from his birth. Maybe while other children had jumped and run and, and, and went around the village, maybe this man labored to even be able to bring a spoon to his mouth. Maybe as this man's brothers and sisters spoke, maybe his words slurred and slipped. Maybe he had actually never known what it was to feel whole. Now, on the other hand, because we don't know his backstory, maybe he had known 
Maybe this was a man who was once very healthy. Maybe there was a time when this man was actually known for his ability to run down the street. Maybe he was the very best at, at running. Maybe there was a time when, when, when this man could outrun every single person in the village. Maybe there was a time every kid in town wanted to grow up and be as fast as this guy. But then maybe one day came an accident, maybe a tumble down a canyon or he slipped down some stairs and maybe suddenly some sharp pain started to pierce through his legs and maybe that pain started to scatter throughout his arms and now suddenly he found that his feet sort of hung from his body like ornaments or, or maybe his hands were, were sort of dangling like sleeves from his side and maybe this poor man, he could see his limbs but he could no longer feel them. Now listen friends, whether, whether this man Man was paralyzed or he became paralyzed, we need to understand in the story that the, the end result was the same. This man had a total dependence on other people around him. Someone had to wash this man's face. Someone had to bathe his body. He probably couldn't blow his own nose or he couldn't even go on a walk. What this man needed in his life was a brand new body from Jesus. He wanted to, to be able to do the things other people did. He, he wanted for the God in heaven, he wanted God in heaven to reach down and heal his body. He had been robbed of arms that could swing or hands that could grip or feet that could dance. All he wanted was a miracle of his body. And that's certainly what his friends wanted for him. So they did what I think any of us would do for a friend, and they tried to get him some help. So they holstered him up on this sort of makeshift mat, and they carried their feeble friend to this carpenter-turned-teacher-turned-miracle-maker who had made his way back into town. And here's the friends with the man, and they are coming to Jesus with hope and faith that Jesus would heal their friend. And Scripture says it was because of their faith that the very heart of Jesus was moved. It was so moved that Jesus turned to the man whose arms and legs lay lifeless, and Jesus spoke to him some of the most unexpected words that we find in Scripture. Instead of Jesus saying, my dear friend, you are healed, he said, your sins are forgiven. Now that is a little odd in the story, right? I mean, put yourself in this scene. Here is a paralyzed man who, who wants healing. He, he didn't come for the forgiveness of sins. He just wanted to fill his arms again. He wanted to fill his legs. Yet Jesus looks at the man and he says, young man, I forgive you of your sins. Now, can we stop here? Why would Jesus say something so radical? Maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, yeah, that, that doesn't really make sense. Let's turn this back on ourselves for a moment. Have you ever been so burdened by sin that you could hardly function? Has sin ever entangled you to a point where maybe you couldn't even get out of bed on your own? Has sin ever controlled your actions or, or caused you to, to do things that you knew you should not be doing? Dear friends, I want to tell you this morning that sin is the great enemy of mankind. Sin is one of the deadliest of all diseases. Sin, it ruins our lives and it can even ruin the lives of others. Sin, it starts wars. Sin murders and sin violates other people. There is no love in sin. Sin claims the lives of its victims and then sin separates us from God. Sin erases hope and sin can even leave us paralyzed with heavy guilt and shame. But Jesus Christ, here he is in this moment and he looks at this man in the eyes and he forgives him of his sin. Because you see in this moment, Jesus was saying that your sin far outweighs your desire to want to walk again. And so Jesus forgave the man on the spot. And here's the, the teachers of the law. And by the way, the teachers of the law, that would be like a, a room of pastors or priests kind of standing over there, you know, looking at Jesus. And here's the Pharisees. And they start saying, well, that's blasphemy. He can't say that. The only person who can forgive sins is God in heaven. And so knowing their thoughts, Jesus looks across the room at the Pharisees who are huddled over in the corner. And he says, excuse me, uh, attention over here, uh, which is actually easier? Is it easier for me to tell this man that his sins are forgiven, or is it actually harder or easier for me to say, get up and walk? And so Jesus, in that moment, he looks at the man and he says, my dear friend, pick up your mat. Go parade through the streets. 
And in that very moment, the town paralytic, he took his body out of park and he shifted his arms and legs into sixth gear and he went flying down the street. Now, can you even imagine in this moment when Jesus said this to this man, can you imagine what happened? Like, I, I wish I would have been a fly on the wall. Like, as, as, the, as the words left the lips of Jesus, I wonder if this man started having like this tingling feeling in his arms and his feet, and suddenly that little tingling feeling, it went into like the sensation of, of sensory shock where suddenly his arms and his legs were pulsating with life again, and suddenly his dry bones were resurrected from a paralytic slumber, and his arms and his legs, they were alive again. They were free to move and dance and leap. Can you imagine what happened in that moment? Jesus displayed his supernatural power when he forgave the man of his sins and when he suddenly breathed new life into the man's brittle bones. This story is a miracle first of forgiveness. It's also a miracle of healing. On this particular day, Jesus was teaching the Pharisees and all of those who were gathered I think two very, very important truths about his wonder-working, miracle-making power in our lives. Hey, if you have your uh, sermon notes, I hope you do, uh, take those out. I want to uh, be very clear in our points today so you can leave here changed and transformed. So maybe you want to write this down. Point number one that we get from this story, here it is. Jesus has the power to confront our sins. Can I get an Amen. Jesus has the power to confront our sins. Let me, let me fill this out a little bit. Jesus, here's what he does. He actually goes beneath the surface. He goes beneath the symptoms. And Jesus is the one who gets to the real problems in our lives. Jesus helps us see what we can't see. Jesus Christ, he digs down deep into our hearts and then he will expose that sin and shame that we have not yet confessed. Here's a, here's a paralyzed man man who was brought to Jesus and he just wanted to be healed physically, but Jesus looks beyond the man's physical problems and he says, no, I'm more concerned about forgiving you of that sin that has poisoned your heart. You see, Jesus, with his great authority in this moment, he first confronted the man's sins. This man needed to be clean. He needed to be made new. He needed to no longer be defined by that sin that was harboring in the hallways of his heart. So instead of first healing the man, Jesus confronted the sin. And he did that with the power of his words. Friends, I want to ask you a very pointed question. It might not be a fun question for you to wrestle with this morning. Are there sins in your life that are right now crippling and poisoning your heart and mind? And you, you know what the answer is. I can't speak it for you. Maybe I should ask it this way. Are there some hidden sins in your life? that are absolutely controlling you and feeling and making you feel helpless and hopeless. Friends, I believe that Jesus has the miraculous power to confront and expose that sin that you've been hiding in your heart. And listen, he's going to do that in love and grace. He's not going to come down like this really hard person. In love and grace, Jesus actually wants to call the sin that's hiding in your heart, and he wants to expose it with his brilliant light. He wants you to no longer be crippled and controlled by your sin. He wants you to no longer be defined by sin. He wants you to be defined by his forgiveness. So I ask you again, what sin right now is Jesus bringing to your mind? You know what it is. What sin is hiding in your heart? What sin does Jesus want to bring out of the darkness and expose by his light? What is it? Name it. Maybe you write it down. If you're too ashamed or embarrassed to write it down, put it in your head. Is it addiction? Is it pornography? Is it lust? Is it disappointment? Is it gluttony? Is it pride? Is it racism? Is it doubt, lying? What is it for you? Is it a filthy mouth? Is it a, 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 a sense of bitterness? Is it rage or revenge? Dear friends, I don't know about you. I can hear Holy Spirit trying to speak to all of us right now. And he is saying, please be honest with yourself and allow Jesus to expose whatever that sin is. 
Friends, maybe this morning, Jesus brought you to Heritage Church for this one simple fact, so that he can confront the sin that's harboring in your heart. Maybe Jesus brought you to this church so that in his beautiful love and grace, he can expose that sin that's been poisoning your heart and mind. You need to believe it with all of your heart this morning that Jesus has the power to confront your sin. And I'm telling you, you need to accept that truth so that that sin can be exposed and so that you can be free in the name of Jesus. The miracle teaches us that Jesus has the power to confront sin, but it gets even better. Jesus also has the power to forgive our sins. Write that down. He also has the power to forgive our sins. Look, as the, as the paralyzed man laid motionless on the mat, Jesus confronted the sin that had been hiding in his heart. And then with the power of his words, he just simply said, young man, your sins are forgiven. Friends, Jesus Christ He has the miraculous power to set you free from sin this morning. Jesus is ready to lavish his grace and forgiveness over you. But here's the thing, dear friends, you have to be willing to receive it. The motionless man on the mat, he not only believed that Jesus could heal him, he also believed that Jesus could forgive him. And in that moment, that man was not only given the gift of healing, but he was also given something far greater. He was given the gift of forgiveness and being set free from that guilt and shame. Friends, I turn it back to you again this morning. Who are you in this story? Are you like the motionless man laying on the mat? Are you in a postured position where you are ready to receive the forgiveness of Christ? Or do you find yourself in this story more like the Pharisees huddled in the back corner with their arms folded, doubting that Jesus really does have the power to forgive you? Who are you this morning? The man on the mat or the Pharisees in the corner? You know, I, I, I think the crazy thing about this story is that the Pharisees, these are the pastors or the priests, these are, these are the, the men who, who knew God's word backwards and forwards, and they were there, and they witnessed this hair-raising miracle where the town paralytic started running throughout the streets, yet after he was running, they still said to themselves, who does this guy think he is? He can't forgive sins. Their hearts, they were so hardened, they refused to believe that Jesus actually had the power and authority to forgive them. And I turn it back to you. How, how could they actually think that? And maybe you're sitting here this morning saying, yeah, if I was one of those Pharisees, that would have been silly. I would have, I would have agreed that Jesus had the, the power and authority to forgive sins. But I would turn it back again. Would you really believe that in the moment? Because here's, here's the problem. How many of us here today have ever doubted Jesus' forgiveness of our own sins? How many of you this morning have ever let Satan convince you that you actually have out God? That one of your past mistakes or sin, no, 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 that's just far too great for God to forgive. How many of you in this room can forgive other people who've hurt you, but you still can't forgive yourself? Maybe you go about your day pushing a wheelbarrow full of shame and sin and regret and guilt, and you say to yourself, I'm never going to forgive myself for what I did. And you've convinced yourself that you're not worthy, that you're not important, that maybe one of those past sins is on God's I can't forgive you top 10 list. Or maybe you find yourself plagued with thoughts that God is actually holding one of your sins against you. Friends, if that is you this morning, please listen. If you continue to live in that state, that that mental state of not accepting Christ's forgiveness, then you're never going to experience God's perfect assurance that you are completely forgiven. Stop identifying yourself with the Pharisees and start identifying yourself with Jesus Christ, the one who has victory over your sins, the one who will conquer your flesh, the one who will conquer your shameful memories, the one who will conquer your guilt and your pain and your shame. Jesus Christ has the power to forgive you. And when he says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And don't trust what I'm saying. 
Trust what the Bible says. Look at Romans 5, 20 through 21. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I get an amen this morning? Wow, what a powerful verse. Let that verse just wash over you this morning. Understand this, dear friends, there is always more grace than sin. Can I get an amen? Always more grace than sin. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of how many times you've done it, it has already been covered by God's grace because of Jesus' death on the cross. Hallelujah. And friends, let me say this. When we question if we have been forgiven by God, We're actually questioning if his grace is sufficient. Jesus has the authority to forgive your sins. So I tell you this morning, accept that forgiveness. Allow him to remove your transgressions as far as the east is from the west. Allow him to wash away your iniquity. Allow him to cleanse you of your sin. God has said that our guilt has been removed. God has said that we have been clean, but it is up to us to believe in that miracle of forgiveness and to accept that forgiveness in our lives. Dear friends, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you regularly confess your sins and ask for that forgiveness, then you need to walk out of here today having no doubt in your mind that you are a forgiven child of God. You need to walk in that freedom this morning. You need to see for yourself who and what you are. You are a child of God. You are no longer defined by your failures, but dear friends, you are refined by them. Let the power of his forgiveness wash over you. Let his forgiveness turn the hardened cracks of your soul into streams of freedom that flow with healing and hope. Dear friends, you will always be a prized possession of Jesus. So I beg you, accept his forgiveness today and let his power set you free. Let's pray. Let's pray. you were here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to forgive you, if you've never confessed your sins, if you've never given your life to Jesus, I just want to give you that opportunity now. And you can pray a prayer like this. Just pray it with me. You can say it silently. Jesus, I believe in you with all of my heart. And I confess to you that there are many sins in my life. I ask for you right now to forgive me of all of my past mistakes and sins. And I pray that your grace would wash over me for all of my future mistakes and sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Jesus, I love you. I will worship you for all eternity. And I will walk out of this place today knowing that I am a forgiven child of God. I pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. And all we need is more of you. We want more of you. I'm learning to have the helper at my side. The gift was fully purchased when the lamb was crucified. So now I freely ask him for his blood has washed me clean. Let the dove of heaven rest upon the Christ in me. Yeah. Let the dove of heaven rest upon the Christ in me.
I just want to thank you for watching today and being part of our service as we worship together, declaring who God is through song, through gathering around the scripture and lifting each other up in prayer. It was just a powerful time uh, to watch this service together and engage with it in that way. Listen, we have a passion and desire at Heritage Church to help you in your journey wherever you are. Maybe for some of you, it's coming to a physical location and finding greater community. Um, in that way, maybe for some of you, you're looking for different ways to connect missionally and, and give of your time in that way as well. Uh, listen, you can go to heritageqc.com at any point and find greater connection in so many different avenues. And we would love for you to do that. Have a great day. We'll see you all again next week.